I got to tell this. This really happened. World War II fighter pilot shot down in the Pacific Ocean, swam to a nearby island, waiting to be rescued, never to be rescued. So he decided to make the best of it on the island, began to build his own house, and then to make life as common as he could, began to build a little town. And years, years later, about 30 or 40 years later, finally, a naval ship comes by, sees him on the island, sends a boat over there. The man is excited. He tells him, I said, I've been here since World War II. I was shot down. Nobody rescued me. And he's all excited. And he says, they're, they're just, they can't believe it. They said, how did you survive all this time? And he said, well, come back in here in the forest a little bit and I'll show you. So they went back and he had this amazing house he had built. I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. It's better than Gillian's Island stuff, okay? And they're just amazed. I mean, because he's, he's got a living room, a dining room, a kitchen. He's got a bedroom and he's just got every, everything that he could make with his hands there. And they were just looking out at the other buildings. And it was like a place where he, when he gathered food, he collected it and put it in a store. And when he would make tools, he'd put them in a, like a little hardware place. I mean, he just built his own little town. And they saw a building there with a steeple. And they said, what is that? And he said, well, he said, I realized that me being alive was from the Lord. And he said, every Sunday, the Lord's day, he said, I'm like John. He said, I go into the Lord's house on the Lord's day and I have church. I have, had my little Bible I had with me and he said, I read the Bible and I kind of preach to myself a little bit and have prayer time and pray for my family and pray for our country and everything like that. And they looked over across the street and there was another church. And they said, well, what is that? And he said, well, that's a church I used to go to but I don't go over there anymore. <laughs> yeah, it took a while, didn't it? Ephesians chapter 6, that didn't really happen. I have to admit, that did not really happen. <clears throat> Craig Shaw told me that joke. Ephesians 6 and then Ephesians 5. Yeah, let me get to that. Ephesians 6, we're learning about devils. And the types of devils that there are. Uh, verse 10 of Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not yours. It is his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities. Those are, and we explained that, those are devils that are princes over any place where there is established authority. Against powers, and we'll probably get into that tonight. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, think stars, think the moon, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, in the Old Testament, they built the high places. I believe, well, I'll, I'll get into that later. I believe the pyramids and the mounds, the Kokia mounds, all the pyramids, all the mounds, I think those are high places. They're men built high places and their religion and their practices and their sacrifices of humans were done on these high places uh, in order to make the gods happy. It's hard to make beasts happy. Amen? It just never works. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to uh, help us tonight, to give us understanding, uh, to give us light. And um, I've got a 
kind of a sad story to tell you tonight, along with uh, what we're giving. It's a true story uh, about what devils drive a person to, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the first day of the week. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for uh, how good you are to us and how you bless us. And Father, we're here to worship you and to sing your songs because your songs are joyful to us. We love them. And we thank you, Lord, for what they mean. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the joy that it puts in our heart. We worship you, Father, not so that you'll do something for us. We worship you because you already have. And Father, if you... If you stopped blessing us from here till the end of our lives, our life is already full of the blessings that you have given us. And Father, we could never ask for more. And yet, Father, you just keep giving us more and more. And you're very good to your children. And we appreciate that. And we thank you for that, God. From the bottom and the depths of our heart, we love you. We ask you, God, that you would guide us tonight as we study your word. Things that are going to be said from your word, Lord, are unpopular in today's world. The world doesn't want to hear it. But, Father, it is truth because your word uh, does not lie. It does not tell us anything that is wrong. And we believe everything that it says. And Father, just give us light. Give us understanding. Help us to see, Father, our relationship with one another and our relationship with you. And help us, dear God, to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Father, give us that strength and give us that victory, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, here in this happy family, um, today's world is, the, in our society, in our culture, we have blended the roles in the traditional family. We have, uh, for the most part, many American families have decided that raising children uh, is a task left up to schools, daycares, and so on. And I'm not necessarily knocking, day we ran a daycare for years, um, but it was, a, it was a necessary thing and our hope was to try to teach children the gospel. Um, but the world we live in is very difficult for just a, just a husband to work outside of the home. It's not impossible, but it is, it is difficult. So I, I understand the times that we live in, and it's, and it's hard to conform our ways to God's ways. Is it warm in here to people? Huh? It's just right. Okay. See, you, you, uh, now I don't know what to do, okay? Who do I make mad, all right? Yeah. I'll turn the air on on this side. I'll turn the heat on on this side. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, somebody change the, who knows what they're doing, flip that over to air. Get a little cool air moving in here. It's a little stuffy. I, I have the benefit of a fan blowing on me, so. But anyway, so I'm not, I, I, I'm not in condemnation of families where both husband and wife have to work. Uh, my wife and I did that for a while, and then God just laid it on a, our heart, her heart first, and then mine. Uh, that she come to be with me here at the church. And God used that. Um, I did a lot of traveling right after that happened. And God knew that. And so I was able to take her and the kids with us all the time. That was a blessing to me. And uh, it was a blessing to my family as well. And so the model that we see up on the screen uh, is, it is old fashioned. But it's not wrong. Okay, and in the situation where the husband is the head of the family, there's no denying that. Southern Baptist Convention several years ago, if I remember my facts right, 
um, they had to do some backpedaling because one of the leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention actually came out and stood up for the biblical roles of a husband, husband being the head of the household. And um, there was a big outcry and a backlash, and it made them look bad, so they did a little bit of backpedaling. And, uh, but there is a major change going on in that denomination and many, many, many other denominations. And uh, there is an effort from what I hear, may just be a rumor, but there's an effort to actually put a woman as the president of Southern Baptist Convention. That may never happen, but who knows how things are going nowadays. Anyway, but I believe, I believe biblically the husband is the head of the household. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, you can turn there. He's, the Apostle Paul said, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Men, listen up. The head of every man is Christ. You can say what you want to about how your wife is not fulfilling her role in the family. But if you are not being led by Christ, then pull the beam out of your eye first. Okay? Every time there was a problem between Lisa and I, God always dealt with me. Always. Mike, fulfill your role. Mike, and, and God, God wasn't hitting me about how I need to take a stand and be the man in the house and wear the pants and use my deep voice and tell my wife what to do. God reminded me that my responsibility to my wife was to love my wife. Because that's what he said. Even though he said, wives obey your husbands, the greater responsibility is on the man. Husbands, love your wives. That right there will solve a lot of the problems in a home. A lot of them. The husband will unconditionally love his wife. Unconditionally. Conditionally. Think of Hosea, who was told to marry a harlot. And not, he not only married her out of commandment, he actually loved her. She, and hoping to change her. She went out then, whoring around on him, and left him. And when he went to seek her out, she was being sold as a slave. He could have, he had all rights to, he could have wrote her a bill of divorce and said, you got it coming. That is not what he did. He bought her, he paid, even though it was already hers, um, or she was already his. He paid the price, bought her, because he loved her. And he loved her unconditionally. And then she changed. Then she became the woman that God wanted her to become. And so, in this role of being the head of the family, <clears throat> the man's responsibility, in my opinion, is the greatest of the responsibilities. Because he is to let Christ rule his life. Christ is in charge. Christ calls the shot. And when I say Christ, I mean the Bible. The Bible calls the shots, the Bible decides the issues, the Bible does this, the Bible, the Bible leads that man's life. And husbands, if you will live by this book, God will honor that. God will bless that. You'll never, you'll never ever be dissatisfied in following the book. Christ follows the book. I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Even Christ, watch this now, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and then saying, I and the Father are one, and yet he is obedient to God, his Father, as an obedient, submissive son. 
Now that's not, I don't see it as a contradiction. I see it as beautiful. I absolutely see that as, as adorable and beautiful. That Christ, even though being equal with God, his Father, is voluntarily, out of love, submissive to the will of his Father, even to the point of going to the cross. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He does that because he loves the Father. And because he loves the Father... He will do what his father tells him to do, and he does it voluntarily. He's not made to do it. He's not forced to do it. He's not take, have, he doesn't have a rod taken to him. He's not disobedient in any way. He does this out of love. So, now, verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For the man is not of the woman. Who created who first? God created the man first, but the woman of the man. So the man was created, the man was alive, the man was in charge, and then God took the rib and formed and fashioned the woman, brought her to the man, and the man said that they too would become one flesh, uniting together. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. So for this cause ought the women to have power on her head because of the angels. Don't even ask me what that means. Because I don't know. One of these days I will, but you'll know it at the same time I do. So, Nevertheless, neither is the man... Without the woman, how were we born into this world, man? Of a woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. We need each other. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So, let the husband commit himself to letting Christ be his head and to loving his wife in that godly fashion. The Bible says, love your wives, be not bitter against them. Okay? Not easy. It's not easy. Okay? You got to pray. Alone, you got to ask God. God, don't let me be bitter. God, don't let me be angry against my. Have bad feelings. If there's another wife better than things, and God. Guard my. So it. It is God's way. Way. Your is, is add my God. If Now can you hear me? See, it, it just works better that way. <clears throat> All right. Ephesians 5. Turn there. Ephesians 5. And, and again, let, let me just say that Lisa and I, we've had our trials. We've had our struggles. 
We've had our times of doubt. We've had our arguments. We've had adverse thoughts. And God has helped us through every one of those. It wasn't easy. And sometimes it still isn't easy. But we have just committed each, ourselves to each other. And this is why she has asked me to be at her side this week. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, she needs her husband. She needs her husband. And um, you know what? That, that honors me. It blesses me that she needs her husband there with her day and night while she is recovering from this surgery. So uh, you pray for her. She's already to the nervous stage, and I get that. So just lift her up before the Lord. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, all, now remember, principalities... Do not like this. And principalities want to destroy this relationship. The first thing they're going to do is sever Christ from the man. Because remember the order. You have God the Father. You have Christ the Son, who is the head of the husband, who is the head of the woman. You follow me? So the first thing principalities will do is sever Christ from the man. That, that principality wants a different authority in place. Think of Naboth and his vineyard. Guys, your wife and family is your vineyard. Christ is the vine. Sever the branch from the vine. What's that branch going to do, John? It's going to wither and die. It can, it can be loaded with grapes. And once that branch is severed from the vine, everything dies. Everything. You don't reattach the grapes back to the vine. It just, that's just going to die. So principalities works against this area right here and targets the man. Targets the pastor. So think of this relationship in this way. You have God the Father, Jesus the Son, who is the, who is the head of the church, and the pastor is an overseer under his authority of the church. So the church ultimately is under the authority of God. Christ is under the authority of the Father. The pastor has to be under the authority of Christ, which is the Bible. Okay? And principalities wants to sever that. Wants to take that pastor out from this book's authority. And it's everywhere. Am I right? I mean, some of y'all are here. Because the churches you were at, that was severed. Principalities got in and killed Naboth and stole the vineyard. Jezebel's role in this. She is the agent by which the authority is transferred from Naboth, who's the rightful owner, to Ahab, who did nothing but steal this man's vineyard. That should have gone to Naboth's son, but he didn't have a son yet. So he stole this man's, not only this man's life and his vineyard, but he stole his posterity, his inheritance, everything. Stole it. Took it away so it vanished. Doesn't exist anymore. There are no sons of Naboth anywhere in the world. Okay? That's what Ahab took. That's what Jezebel got for him. She is always the agent of that transfer. So anytime you see a church or a denomination or a ministry go south, she did it. She caused it. She worked her work in there behind the scenes to get the authority transferred. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now he's making the connection here. It's the, 
We have a church situation. We have a family situation. Both, in both areas, there is authority, and Christ is the authority in both of them. They both operate in much the same fashion. The husband must be under the authority of Christ. The pastor must be under the authority of Christ. And the church is under that authority. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ and unto the word of Christ, because they're the same thing, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife. There it is right there, husbands. Love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church, and the definition for love is right here. Gave. Gave. True love is unconditional giving. It is a gift given that requires no thank you. I gave Hunter candy a while ago. You know what he said? Boff. Ball. He had a ball in his hand. I'm going to give him candy again. Why? Because I love him. And I love him unconditionally. And I'm going to continue to give my grandchildren candy. And I appreciate the fact that their parents say, Tell Papa thank you. Tell Papa thank you. Okay? And every now and then, I get a, Thank you, Papa. Which makes my whole day. But if I don't get it, I'm giving the candy out next day, same thing. Unconditional. Whether they thank me for it or not. We don't, we don't see that kind of love in this world much. It is very, very rare. That word in the Bible is charity. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 says charity and not love. It is un, an unconditional giving that requires no thanks. It requires no payback. It requires nothing. You are giving voluntarily to somebody simply because you love them. Why did God give you salvation? Where were you when God gave you salvation? You were down deep in a pit. And God rescued you out of there. It was a pit that you dug for yourself. It was your own sin. It was your own iniquity. It was your own wickedness. You were breaking God's rules when he gave you his only begotten son's life for your life. Now you taught that. Okay, I had, I, when Matthew came into the world, that thought occurred to me. Would God ever ask me to give my son's life up for somebody that I don't like? Somebody that did me wrong? I didn't think I could do it. Been mad at him a few times, thought about it, but still didn't think I could do it. I'm not God. I am not God. I don't know that I could voluntarily give my son up for people that I don't like. But God commended this love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's an unconditional giving of Christ the Son to the entire world, though the entire world thinks God is, doesn't exist or is mean or whatever. But they're not going to worship him. So, he, he husband, as the, even as, therefore, as the church subject Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his, not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That is God's unconditional. What conditions does God lay upon salvation? What do you have to do? To, what do you do to merit it? Do you make yourself a better person and then get it? No. You're the worst person in the world and God gives it to you anyway. How wretched can a man get to where he cannot get salvation? There is no limit to the wretch of man's wickedness that God will not save him out of it. Amen? That kind of love right there needs to exist in our homes, in this church, in this church. Not only for one another, 
But for lost people out here, very lost people out here, very wicked people out here need the love that we can give them and should give them. Okay? Um, we paid a woman's electric bill this week. I have no idea who she is. Okay? But we did it. Alicia called me. Dad got a, got a woman here. Said she needs help with an electric bill. Now, we don't give money right to the person. That's, we don't do that. We call the electric company, find out what's going on, and then take care of it that way. I don't know who this woman is. Don't need to know. But we gave it. Okay? And you can't, you can't outgive God. Okay? So that kind of love right there. Unconditional giving. Now, I'd like for this woman to start coming to this church. That'd be great, wouldn't it? I cannot begin to tell you the number of electric bills, gas bills, fueling cars down here at the gas station because I don't give them money for gas. I take them, take them down there and fill their tank up. Okay? I cannot tell you the number of people that we've done that way and not one of them sits in this church. Not a one. And even some of them say, well, well we like this church. We'll come to the church. Never happens. Never happens. I'm not going to stop. Not going to stop. Okay? It's the right thing to do. The Bible says, give to him that asketh. That's unconditional love. It's hard. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but that's what we're supposed to do. It's what we're here for. So if you husbands would keep that in mind, I know that sometimes because a woman is different than a man, I know that sometimes the way she rationalizes the world and the way he rationalizes the world is two different rationalizations. And I know that sometimes husbands just go, are you an idiot or what? What's wrong with you? What, what, why do you think this way? We never say that out loud. Huh? You're saying it too? Well, you're wrong. The Bible says so. And it leaves us with question marks. Remember, the woman has two X chromosomes. The difference in the male is that he's got a Y chromosome, because we're always going, why? Why? Why are, you, why are you thinking that way? What's wrong with you? Sometimes they can stretch our patience. It's the same the other way. I get that. And there's going to be tension, but that's when, when it gets to the point to where you're going, I'm bitter at my wife. That's when you get alone and you pray and say, God, you asked me not to be bitter at my wife, and I'm bitter, and I want you to take that away from me. Because I want to honor you, and I want to show my wife that I love her, and I don't want anything to get in that way. Okay? I promise you, you can pray yourself into a sweet mood. You can pray your wife into the same thing. I promise you. Okay? I just, there's things that I've learned in marriage. Things that I've learned from, from the years spent with this woman. And God has helped us in everything we've been through. Okay? Now, uh, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. I, I don't have a problem with a husband adorning a wife. And I'm not good at picking stuff out for a sweetie pie, but I'm pretty good at paying for it. Okay? I don't mind paying for it. What, honey, whatever you want. You want that ring? $3,000? Sure, I'll get it for you. I don't care. Do we have the money? I don't care. We'll get it somewhere. Okay? I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not that, I'm not that bad, but I'm just saying I don't mind letting my wife have things. I don't mind it. We got the, as long as we got the money, I don't mind it. Okay? 
I want to make her happy. I want her, I want her to be satisfied. I want her to love her husband. I want her to respect me and look up to me. I want her to know that I'm going to take care of her. I want her to know that I'm going to be there. I want her to know that I'm going to be by her side. I want her to have that comfort. Christ, we, we beg for Christ to come be near us. We want to know that Christ is going to be there. We want to know that Jesus is going to stand by us no matter what we do. And we don't treat him right. We do not treat Jesus very well sometimes. We are like a very angry wife. We treat our Lord and our Savior and our husband pretty bad sometimes. But he still loves us. And he still wants to adorn us. He still wants to pre present it to himself as a glorious church. Well, that's, you, can't, you can't get any better than that. There ain't a religion in the world that touches this. Amen? So, uh, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his flesh, but nourished and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Husbands, if you, think, if you don't think anything about spending $500 on a new saw, then buy your wife a new sewing machine or whatever she needs. Get her a dishwasher. Buy her a maid. Whatever. Okay? Take care of her. Take care of her like you take care of yourself. You want to spend money on yourself? Spend it on her first. Then spend it on yourself. Amen. Amen. Now look up here. Here's what's happened to the American man. These are the principalities that came in and destroyed godly men. Drugs, liquor, gambling, lasciviousness, fornication, adultery. This, this is why we don't have that this is why we don't have that anymore. It's absolutely destroyed godly roles of men in our country. Destroyed it. Man spends his life in pornography, alcohol, drugs, gambling. He's not going to be any kind of man worth having. He's not going to be a good father. He's going, to, he's, going to have, he's going to make children, but not raise them. He's going to let them do whatever they want to, and they better not get in his way. This is principalities at work right here. Once they have, once they've severed, this is what severs the man from Christ. This is what severs pastors from Christ. You think I'm kidding? Principalities knows how to go after a man of God. Get him where he's weak. Get him on dope. Get him a... You would be surprised the number of pastors that are drunkards. The number of pastors that are feeding all week long on lasciviousness. Having eyes full of adultery, the Bible said. You'd be surprised at the numbers in this country, they have severed the man of God from his head, which is Christ. Now they have taken over. And they are ruling through this man. And they have stolen the vineyard. Stolen it. Because now it belongs to them. And this man is going to be led by these spirits. And he's not going to preach right. He's going to let sodomites come in his church. He's going to let people that are committing fornication to have major roles in his church. That's what, and, and he's going to preach this way. He's going to teach people how they can enjoy these things in life and still be Christians. It's sickening. That same way with the American husband. American and, and American politicians. You think we ought to have politicians that are drunkards? You think it's good to have politicians counting our money that are gamblers? 
Nope. You think it's good to have judges that are dope heads? Who are using their, their position as a judge to, to take bribes in the form of drugs from drug addicts or drug dealers that come in their court. That happens. Happens a lot. A family that watches our church. The man on the your right with the skeleton thing in front of his mouth. 22 years old, he's the first cousin of a woman in a family that follows our church. This is the, the people that he hangs around with. 22 years old, put a pistol in his head and blew his brains out. Why do you think he did this? Spirits. Absolutely spirits. Look at who he's hanging with. I had to cover up the guy in the back. Had to cover up his hand. Because I didn't want to show it. I'm glad the cover showed up here on my little tablet here. Okay? The guy with the O on his hat, he's making the devil sign. The guy with no shirt on, smoking marijuana, drinking God knows what. And so the man on the right put a pistol in his head and blew his brains out. 22 years old. Okay, that's powers. Powers. The working of devils through human agents. Causing them to have supernatural powers or abilities. ESP, which is extrasensory perception. Telekinesis. Telepathy. Divination. Witchcraft. Black magic, white magic, gray magic, all kinds of sorcery, wizardry, getting in contact with familiar spirits, getting knowledge from familiar spirits. What did Saul do? What did he want? He wanted a familiar spirit. He wanted a devil to tell him what to do the next day. He wanted information, knowledge from a devil specifically from a devil. He asked for a devil. Why? Because God said that he took the spirit of the Lord from him and gave him an evil spirit. And because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, he ended up practicing witchcraft a day before he died. A day before he took his own life. Make sense? A day before he took his own life, Saul went to witchcraft. Endora. The witch of Endor. That's who he went to. That's who he turned to because of his rebellion. So that's what powers do. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. I, it's 5 o'clock and I'm not even going to try to run through this in two minutes. Not even going to try. Deuteronomy 18. Several years ago, I tried making five-minute videos. And I gave up. I gave up. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. This is what we're going to look into. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Don't. Learn their ways. Don't buy their books. Don't do it. There shall not be found among you one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Or that useth divination. Divination basically is trying to follow spirits to gain wisdom or understanding or to predict the future. You have in your hand... All of the future that you need. Your Bible, it tells you what's going to happen. It's, it's got everything in it. And I mean, it's got everything in it. It's got your life. Just ask God 
to give you wisdom from his word and he'll give it. What's he charge for it? He gives it freely. He gives it liberal. It's the only thing God is liberal about is giving wisdom away liberally. So the, 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 God said, don't, don't let them use divination or an observer of times. That is astrology or any other kind of saying, well, on this particular day, God is more powerful on this day than he is on these other days here. And if you do the ritual on this day, then you get more power than other people. That is an observer of times or an enchanter, one who gives out spells or enchantments. The, the wizards of Pharaoh turned their rods into serpents by enchantments, by casting spells, or a witch. God still hates witchcraft. He still hates it. He hates it because he knows the spirits that are behind it. He knows that they're very mean, they're very vicious, they're very cruel, and if you follow them, you think you've got power, but you don't. They are controlling you, and they will destroy you. That's why God hates it so bad. He knows the devils that are behind it, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, Harry Potter. You do not read. I, I have a, a friend, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. He said that a free will Baptist missionary read Harry Potter and enjoyed it and told him to read it. He said, oh, you'll like it. And he said to him, uh, that's wizardry. Oh, no, no, there's nothing wrong. You, you don't, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Go ahead and read it. This man's on the home mission field trying to build a church. So my friend, who was a youth pastor, he said, I got a copy from the library and I read it. And when I closed the book, I wanted to be a wizard. I get it. I get it. Or a necromancer. That is having consultations with the dead. Or using the dead to gain power. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, now, is, does it make a difference if it's white or black magic? Does it make a difference? White magic's good, isn't it? I mean, you can do white, I mean, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote about white magic, and that's good. That's good magic. It does good things, right? God said he hates it. He hates it. I don't care what color you paint it. He hates it. Okay? Uh, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. This is why God got rid of the Canaanites and left their cities and their houses empty so the Israelites could move in to their houses and live in their cities. Jerusalem was a city belonging to the Canaanites. And God let Israel overtake it and own it. And they took it over. Verse 13. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou, which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observer of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God will not allow you to do that. Now, look up here. Christian witches. I wasn't making it up. And the caption is, for those of us who love Christ and the craft and are unwilling to give up either. No, you don't love Christ. You're a liar. You're a wolf. See that wolf? That tells you the spirit right there. This website belongs to this lady. I'll get more into that. Yet Christians using tarot cards. That's cardomancy. It is divination by way of using cards. And it's the other Bethel church in Redding, California doing this. The other Bethel church. Not this one. Better not be this one. Better not be this one. Okay? I, I, listen, I won't, I, won't, I won't put up with it. I, won't, I don't like it. I don't want it affecting anybody in this church. Because it is dangerous, it's deadly. 
The devils behind it are real and they will destroy that powers. And I don't want them around. Amen? But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God is not being mean by telling us we can't do these things. He's watching out for us because he loves us and he wants to protect us from the devils that are behind all of this magic and all these powers. Okay? I, want, I don't want them here. I don't want nothing to do with them. I'm not going to have people jump up and say, oh, I'm getting a word of wisdom from God. Oh, I'm getting a word of knowledge from God. I don't, I don't buy it. You want, to, you want to tell me what verse it is? We'll read it together. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I'll get into this next Sunday, and it's going to be, it's going to be rough. Because there's, there's stuff that you'd be amazed what's creeping in churches. And I'll have all week sitting in the hospital to study this thing, put it together, okay? I love you. God loves you. Chris, you don't have to stand. Bless your heart. But thank you for coming tonight. God, it's good to see you. Amen. Amen. I love you. I want God's best for you and your family. I'm not, I am not in any way trying to be mean or harsh or cruel about showing you God's way and God's best. Okay? And I'll leave it up to you. You, got, you. you can pray and get things from God just as well as I can. I never really thought myself the kind of pastor that thinks he needs to meddle in everybody's home business and get involved and tell them what to do all the time. I try to stay out of that. I don't, I don't like it. I don't, I don't have time for it. But... You have to, you, your family has to seek God out and ask God what he wants you to do, okay? It's all I ask anybody is ask God, all right? Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you, God. Lord, we live in a world that has taught us strange ways, ways that are strange to your word. And I understand, God, that when it comes to the Bible and it comes to the the way that this Bible tells us to live, people are, even churches, see it as antiquated. It's not for us in this time. Doesn't mean anything now. Or is poorly translated or whatever. Father, this Bible's right. And it sets a high standard for us. Lord, that's not bad. We need a high standard. We need a goal to attain. We need something, Lord, to, that'll make us want to rise up and, and become better than what we are. Gives us a, a high goal, Lord, to attain. Something to work for, something to strive for. There's nothing wrong with that. And Father, give us your best for our church, for our families. God, we would even pray for our county in our state in our country god we want your best for america now, i know there's a lot of sin in this country but god it's not anything that you can't handle so father lord show us your best and help us to live by it thank you for this word dismiss us now in your care we love you in jesus name and all of god's people said amen, amen. god bless you you are dismissed tonight